Hello, gentlemen. Good morning. How are you? Hey, I'm guys. Great. Good. 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 What's going on? Man, it's springtime. Springtime set. Yeah. The we'll sun, see. The sun is up today, and it's glaring. I don't. I don't trust the weather. Uh. Oh. I do want to say. So um, we had our episode 100, mm -hmm. and uh, then it got bumped mm -hmm. by episode. And a later episode, right? right. Yeah, real Russian episode, mm -hmm. Russian and Ukraine episode. So, mm -hmm. um, I listened. I listened to it last night. It was yeah. actually pretty good. Yeah, so that was episode one hundred. Yes, yes, that was. You know, so anyway, we might uh, confuse some people when episode one hundred and one oh, that's releases because we announced it, and there and we're celebrating one hundred. So if you. Well, you can, you, you can, if, you're, if you're a super fan and you're listening right now, that's why <laughs> you can record a For little the two bumper. people out there, Brad's, Brad's wife and my mom, my mom listens too. So, okay. <laughs> so there's three. <laughs> well, we have a special okay, episode. Okay. We can get into it. I'm sorry. I'm today. sorry. No, no, no. Be apologize. It's, fine. it's, a, it's uh, we need to clarify these things for all our fans. Yes. So we have a special, special guest with us today. Um, we're getting trying to get back on the track of, of getting guests in. And his name is Mr. Eric Jensen. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for a company called Predictive ROI. Eric, welcome. Discussion. Hey, gentlemen. Good to be here this morning. You're, from, you're in Salt Lake right now? I am in Salt Lake. Yep. Originally a Minnesota boy, but moved out here. That's I'll be there on Sunday. Uh, oh, well, so you're going to be out in uh, Salt Lake on Sunday? Yeah, I'm going to Park City. Uh, you know, that's what I hear a lot of when people are coming into Salt Lake. It's just to get into the airport and then drive up to Park City. Yeah, so. how's the snow there? Hopefully it's decent. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, down in the valley, there's uh, there's nothing. So yeah. I don't know if that bodes well for you. Yeah, I don't know either, but we'll find out. I'm sure they'll manufacture I got to look at the... the, the <laughs> Yeah, Park City does snow like all year round, right? No, <laughs> close, close. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I'm sure they would love it. They would, uh, they would love the tourism. Yeah, wow. they're one of the best, though. Well, Eric, um, yeah, I don't know a lot about predictive ROI. I know a little bit, so um, I wanted intentionally to go into this uh, to have a true conversation. So, tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, and and what you guys are doing. Yeah, uh, happy to do that. So the, the short answer for Predictive is we help agencies, coaches, and consultants build a position of thought leadership and then monetize it. Mm. Um, so we know we've done uh, primary research ourselves. We've studied a lot of other uh, research and literature around it and authority positioning for you know these sorts of B2B service industries is hugely important because it increases the, uh, the amount of money that you can charge. It makes the sales process faster. Uh, it reduces the amount of, uh, of communication you have to have uh, around each sale and uh, your clients stay with, stay with you longer. So those are all pretty good factors uh, for, for, most, for most B2B service industries, especially for agencies, coaches, and consultants, yeah. Yeah, what's your background? How did you end up at Predictive ROI? My background is super diverse. Uh, some of it would sound uh, almost made up, um, but I eventually came to uh, Predictive through uh, college. I met my business partner when I was there and he and I uh, started talking. We got along super, super well. And uh, he left the university uh, to go and start Predictive and uh, a year later, gave me a call and said, hey, I really want you to, to come on board. Uh, so he and I had some discussions around that. And here I am uh, 11 years later. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So so I got to ask, why does, it, why does your background sound made up? Oh, man. Uh, tell, so, tell us the story. <laughs> let, let us be the judge. <laughs> so I paid my way through college. Uh, doing juggling events with my brother all around the country. Nice. That's um, part of a circus? Uh, uh, no, we, I, we didn't do those sorts of events. We did other sorts of events, okay. uh, street fairs, art festivals, historical events, that sort of stuff. Um, and grew up uh, eight years without any running water and electricity just came in through an extension cord. So we like went logging, we trained oxen, um, horses, did around farming, that sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, even before that, just, you know, was born and raised in typical kind of uh, suburbia America. So 
uh, all, all sorts of different uh, experiences got me to where I am today. Gotcha. Wow. All right. So suburbia to juggling to living without electricity and running water. Yeah. Just flip the, jug the juggling. Okay. All right. The, the juggling the comes third. Stuff. All right. Juggling third. <laughs> yeah. And now you're so here. So suburbia and then middle of nowhere <laughs> and then juggling and then uh, university and, uh, and predictive. predictive. So, okay. So, yeah. um, I mean, I know uh, these are always interesting stories, right? Because people don't often hear about how and why businesses started and especially small businesses yeah. um, and, and ages, agencies, right? And so how did those things or how did, how did you go from that stuff, right? Into, did you start yeah. your own agency at some point? And yeah. You, or, so, or do you still um, have that agency? Talk through that a little uh, bit. So, so uh, Predictive is is uh, the first agency um, that I've been a part of. We've gone through many iterations. I think that's pretty common. Um, like most agency, <laughs> like most agency owners, uh, it was started off with being a good practitioner, and then moving forward and and saying, "Hey, could probably do that for others." Um, so when Stephen first envisioned uh, Predictive, um, it was for SEO, and he wrote a book around SEO and everything along those lines. Um, and he was very, very good at that that practition of it. Uh, but then came the reality of of owning a business and all of the challenges that came along with it. So I apologize. I I thought um, because Predictive is towards agencies, right? I want to clarify that, right? Like you're. Is You're now. helping agents, right? It is now. So, um, I thought I thought it may have changed companies, but you sounds like it just you sort of pivoted at a certain point yeah. or, or transitioned or evolved, right? That's probably better because that's what all, all of us are doing. Um, yep. Uh, so, um, when and why did that happen? Oh, uh, so uh, we pivoted from SEO uh, over to uh, what we called guaranteed contracts. Um, because we realized that the the metrics uh, and the data that was coming from uh, SEO was hugely powerful and it moved the needle for businesses. But a lot of times, um, you know, we were in a position of trying to optimize air. Mm, yeah. Organizations just didn't have anything that was there to be able to be optimized. Um, and as you can imagine, that's kind of hard. So uh, right. instead what we said is, hey, we can take on not only the SEO side, but we can take on the content side and we can really uh, control the whole sales funnel from top to bottom. Um, and we did it in um, maybe a bit too drastic of a way. We, uh, we offered guaranteed contracts where we would say, um, we're guaranteeing you that you will get um, you know, 2X or 3X or 4X return on the investment uh, with us. And if we don't get that, then you get all your money back. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and we loved doing the work and it was awesome. Um, and then we learned something else, which is sometimes we don't have control. You don't have full control. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the lesson that everyone learns, right? At some right. point. <laughs> and so there were things like we were doing our job really, really well. And the company we were working with didn't actually have the products to sell. Their inventory and their SKUs were empty. Mm. Um, and unfortunately that was still our responsibility, uh, in, at the end of the day, because we weren't able to make those things work or, um, you know, other situations like that occurred. And so after a little while of doing that, we realized like, Hmm, that's probably not going to be the best business model. Uh, I'll tell you, it was easy to sell. Um, right. and the work was fun and it was, uh, it was super rewarding and engaging, uh, but not having that full control ended up being uh, more of a problem than what we uh, we had expected. And uh, so we shifted over uh, at that time. We had started a podcast for ourselves. So you guys can understand that. Um, and we loved it. We had a blast doing it. And then we had several clients come up to us and say, hey, could you do that for us? Well, we already had a depth of expertise in the content area, and we, we had started to develop our own thought leadership uh, positioning and platform, um, and we started down that road. And that's, that's really what hooked Stephen and I as far as we just love doing that work. We, we really love helping companies niche down, go an inch wide and a mile deep, and get their smarts out of their head down to some place that someone can consume. 
um, and, and really leveraging their time around content, because as I'm sure all three of you know, uh, when it comes to creating this sort of content, there is a time investment. There's a big time investment. And sometimes that can feel like a mountain that is impossible to climb over or maybe not worth climbing over. How long ago days. was it when you made that transition? Um, you it's about know. five years ago. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And, yeah. Um, and you also sort of pivoted or, or, or transitioned from serving just anybody to niching down to agencies, consultants, and coaches. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And I, I wish that we had niched down sooner, faster, and deeper uh, than, than we did. I think if there's any one lesson that I would take if I were to uh, tell anybody who's just new to running a business, I don't care if it's agencies, coaches, or consultants, or something else, uh, go narrow fast. Yeah, that's great advice. Mm. Yeah, we talk about that often. We've experienced that. And um it's counterintuitive and it's scary, especially, I think, I think especially in the agency space, like, you know, um, when you're talking about smallish, I, I, well, even large agencies, right? Like there's this idea that we can, we want to and can do everything. Um, and we don't want to turn down anything. Um, and that's kind of counterintuitive to actually specializing and niching down. I think, yeah. I yeah. Go ahead. And that kind of comes from, in my experience anyway, that kind of comes from two things. One is this mentality around scarcity, right? If I say no <laughs> to everybody except my niche, am I going to have uh, a big enough market that's viable, right? And then I think the other side to that is brain candy, right? I mean, most agency owners I know are in business because they love tackling sticky problems, right? They love the, the puzzle that's in front of them and they want to find the solution. And so they, they tend to want to embrace every puzzle that comes in. It doesn't matter uh, <laughs> which business it's from, what sort of problem it is. They're like, yeah, I can totally solve that. Yeah. Um, so I think those are two reasons why that is, is a challenge. I mean, that's the personality of the, the practitioner, the artist, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you, you know, not the business owner it's a different type of personality. The business owner needs to figure out how do we make this business make money and be scalable. Um, right. I just have one last question for you in this little piece. I'm just trying to get milk out the history here. And it, can you see Brad's like holding it? Oh, no, Brad's no, like no, ready no. to go. I'll wait till the end's done. Right? <laughs> I just want to know why, why agencies, coaches, and consultants, like why did you decide to niche down in that way? Uh, so for us, it was a mix of, uh, it happened to be where we had strong connections and relationships and understanding of the business models. Um, and we already had clientele there and an intentional choice of these are folks that we really enjoy working alongside. Um, in our experience, most agencies, coaches, and consultants, they're fun people. Like the people that run them, the people that own them, the people that work in them, they're fun, smart, driven people. And most of them genuinely want to serve the audience that they're helping. I mean, they're not, they're not doing it to get rich. What they're doing is because they love the work and, and they love being able to, to problem solve. That's great. I would, I would echo that for sure. Having been in the agency world a long time with Brad, we're the old guys here. There's uh, speak for yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I would, I would, I love the, um, I love the idea that you're serving that those niches because definitely when it comes to this whole idea of, of thought leadership, which I want to get, I want to get into more with you. Um, mm -hmm. And Brad, feel free to jump in with your thoughts and questions too. Um, I've seen I've seen that term and that um, I guess that world evolve over the past twenty years, um, yeah. and what it even means. Um, and I guess the interpret even when you say it, sometimes depending on who you're talking to, you know, you might get some raised eyebrows, you might get some questions. But I'd love to hear how you define that term and what what. Like just high level strategically, what do you see as your role and how you serve your clients? Awesome. I think you've got one reaction too, which is the eye roll. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the, the position of thought leader is, is really um, viewed as a moniker you add for yourself. Um, and that is definitely not the work that we aim to do. I think probably the easiest description of this is 
if you need to have heart surgery, do you go to generalist or do you go to a specialist? Right. Specialist for sure. Right. And, and so you can, you can put all sorts of other stories and analogies and examples in place um, in order to show the benefit of having a position of thought leadership. But if you are known within your space for solving certain problems for certain people, that's a pretty powerful position um, because most businesses are not looking to hire a company to come in and solve all of their woes. Quite frankly, if they are, they're going to be disappointed, right? None of us can solve every problem in every client's business. It's just not feasible. But we can get really good and really efficient at solving a specific problem for a specific type of business. And so thought leadership is really about staking your claim. And we call it planting your flag, planting your flag of authority in the space that you want to own. Okay. Um, and so that comes with a couple of pieces that are intersecting, right? It's your expertise. It's your experience and it's your give a shit and I, uh, or <laughs> give a crap or <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you yeah. guys allow, uh, we lost the clean, we lost the clean flag. All cool. I'm just kidding. Sorry, I'm just kidding. No, just, no joking. Yeah. Sorry, uh, but, but I mean, really, that's, that's what it gets down to. Why do you care? Right. And, right. and so if I know this is, this is my, my area of expertise, my focus, my niche, um, you know, this is why I actually care about what I, I'm doing. And, and this is my experience um, that makes how I solve that problem unique or different than other people. Odds are pretty good. You're going to have very few competitors that have all of those three things aligned. And then thought leadership is simply about making sure that it's known outside of your head. It's amazing how many times you can go in and talk to even an internal team and say, what do you do here? And I'm like, I don't know. And they'll give a different answer than mm -hmm. every other person, let alone the owner or the leader of the organization, right? So thought leadership is really not just an external tool. It's also an internal tool to help focus energies of this is what we do. This is who we serve. This is how we serve them. This is the language that we use. And we are dogmatic about it, right? Mm. There yeah. are kind of 10 truths of authority and a couple of those, um, and I'm not going to rattle them all off because that'll be boring, right? Um, and, and we've got books and stuff that, that outline all that stuff in a better way. But if I were to take content from one company and be able to just lift it and put it into somebody else's company and no one would notice that's yeah. not thought leadership mm -hmm. that's just fluff mm -hmm. yeah that's right? a good that's a good filter yeah that's a good litmus test right so sometimes do you have to start from ground zero with these uh with your clients where you have so to for us yeah we we started doing that <laughs> <laughs> at the very beginning, uh, we, we realized that that was, that was not our sweet spot. Um, and so we really help companies that are already in the one to $10 million range. They've got a business behind them and they just really need to sharpen it um, mm. because they're already serving um, businesses. They already have a functional business behind them. And what they want to do is they really want to, uh, to dive in deep and to own a space and be known within a space in a different way. Mm. Um, man, I, 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 this is stuff that's really interesting to me and, you know, close to my heart because I believe in it. Um, you have those three areas that you help people kind of figure out what their niche is. Is that right? Like what, what they, your thought leadership position specialization is. is yeah. That that's, that's one, one, one piece part, one yeah, part. Yes. 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 I feel like though, I mean, t you tell me because you talk to these people all the time, uh, but I feel like there's not a lot of, like that's a hard, like figuring that out, planting your flag is a difficult one. And so uh, maybe on the fly, I don't know, could we just offering value to agencies, consultants, coaches, whoever's listening, even big ones, um, how do you go about doing that? Like walk us through you know, the questions that someone can ask themselves if you, if you can, or like that thought process where I could get to, okay, here's my, here's my flag. Here's the flag that I should be planting. Yeah, absolutely. 
So most companies of the size that we're working with, um, it's really about kind of cutting away the fat rather than reinventing themselves to be able to find that. Um, so one of the big areas that we really ask first is what are the problems that you solve? Like, what is your superpower? Right? If, if there's one, if there's a client that walks in the door and they tell you their problem, do you almost like rub your hands in glee because you know, you're going to be able to knock that out of the park for that particular client. That's a pretty good sign that the superpower for you. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's a good basis to start because most companies don't have a superpower by accident, right? They probably have a superpower because that's tied deeply to the company's founder or the company's history in some way. And they have the staff, the processes and the reputation to be able to do that quickly, efficiently, and well. So I think starting at that point is really, really good. And the next thing that I usually ask when someone says that is I said, okay, what's your proof of that? Where are the testimonials? Where are the case studies? What actually shows that you can do that work with excellence? Um, and the reason that we ask that question is, is because we don't want someone to just flippantly say, oh, well, we're really good at this, 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 this. And, you know, they list two dozen things. And it's like, okay, well, what do you have proof that you've done really, really well? And that tends to narrow it down again, pretty, pretty uh, tight, right? Um, and you have some options too, because when we talk about thought leadership and expertise, um, there are different levels, right? So you can be really good at doing work for a particular vertical, particular industry. And, and that's, that's great. You know, that, that's, a, that's a good way to niche down. That's like one level of stuff. Another way is you could be really, really good at helping companies with a particular sort of audience. Let's say every client that you serve wants to reach, you know, moms that are between 35 and 50. And you know everything about that audience and how to reach them. Okay, so you've got a particular expertise. That's, that's great. Or you might want to filter it through the problem that you solve. We're awesome at being able to solve problem X. We happen to know industry X, Y, and Z have that problem. But the problem is what we're really, really good at. Now, if you, if you really want to have a position of thought leadership, if you really want to niche down, and I know that this is going to scare the bejesus out of most of your listeners, if they're, if they're still thinking about this, you want to apply all three filters, right? You can do them one at a time though. You right? can do them one at a time, right? So don't, don't think it's an all or nothing. Even if you apply one filter, you've already started to move down the path towards being in a niche and being a thought leader within that space, as long as while you're going down that niche, you're talking about what it is that you're learning, experiencing and seeing and being helpful uh, to folks with that particular audience, problem or industry, right? You know, from, from my own experience, you know, the idea of specializing and niching down was scary because I thought I got to turn away business, I got to fire clients. And then like, you know, a, a light bulb went off in my head and this was probably, this was back eight, nine years ago, but I'm like, I'm not going to turn down at the moment. Like, just hear me out for a second. Cause it sounds, sounds different, but like, I'm just gonna, I'm going to go out and add this. Like, I know this is my specialty. So I'm just going to go out and add that. And I'm gonna, it's going to be the icing on top right now. And then as I grow into that, you know, I can trim down the other stuff. Yeah. So it's a transition, slower transition than just it's an a over, growth. It's not an overnight. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like more I would say it's more yeah. like I'm adding a new thing versus I'm taking away all all but one thing, mm. and that can help. You know, you've got staff, you've got all these things, right? Like people can't just say oh, I'm going to cut out like fifty percent of my revenue that's not in my niche. Can't do that. Right. How? Yeah, how? and and we use an analogy of fishing versus a fishing net. So mm. when we talk about right. thought leadership, when we talk about narrowing down and niching down. What we're talking about is who are you fishing for? If you're fishing for something, you have to have the right bait. You got to, you know, fish at the right time of year. You got to be in the right, you know, body of water. You've got to be at the right depth, all those things. If something happens to swim into your net, a client that comes in and says, I want to work with you, 
We're not saying turn them down if you can do great work for them. What we're saying is, who are you as a company intentionally fishing for right. so that you can build up that body of work and that clientele? How, how nuanced? Uh, well, let me ask it this way. You, you go through that process and a client, you know, you get to the end point and you say, you come back to your client and you're working with them and they say, okay, here's what we advise is your specialty. And here's where we think we can really use that to, to really capitalize on and, and help you with that. What if you get, have you ever had clients that, or, or an agency that you get down to that and there's either, um, a surprise or maybe you know that's great we're good at it but we don't want to be that it, do, you, do you understand where i'm going like what uh, uh-huh. yeah so um one of the pieces that we have implemented on the front end of our services is something that we call sprint it is a 90-day deep dive to make sure that the company is one in a position to be able to do the work that we do and two has buy-in which is kind of what you're talking about in the second part of your question Mm -hmm. um you're right because we can't we can't force a company to dive in to being narrower we can't force them to be prolific in their thought leadership we can't force them to be relentlessly helpful none of those things are something that we can require from a client um and so at the very least you know during during the sprint process we can give them an entire content outline as far as what they should be talking about how they should be talking about which sort of companies and clientele they should be aiming for how to approach those um how to increase their lead gen for those sorts of clients um the sorts of offers that they need to have in place what their value ladder needs to look like all that stuff is just included in sprint right and so that's the plan this is the this is this is the blueprint moving forward, um, and then there is the question, right? Of is there buying? Is there not? And if there's not, that's okay. We we understand it's scary. I mean, you were, you guys were talking earlier about like how scary it is to niche. I think that's because a lot of people view their business as like their baby, right? We hear we hear that all the time. Like, oh man, my business is like my, it's like my own kid, right? It's not, right? And when when we talk about focusing in on a small piece what it feels like to many business owners is we're asking them to cut their baby in half mm. right they don't have a baby yeah. they have a grapevine do you a grapevine has to be trimmed down if you want to get really good fruit from it do you find that when you propose the sprint after the 90 days that it there's some business they have to shed which would um you know see a little downturn in their revenue for a short time no, we don't really recommend, um, you know, getting rid of uh, a lot of existing clients or things mm-hmm. along those lines. Again, what we do is we just help them start fishing for the right clients. Got it. So it's more scaling and then eventually find their niche to the point where these right. maybe current clients decide that they're not the right fit eventually. But Well, and one of the things we, we often find is that there are clientele that they're serving they really don't want to be serving. Mm. And so part of the part of the work is going towards, okay, we need to replace those clients, right? For a happier, healthier business and business owner and team and all of those things. So let's replace those with the right fit clients. Awesome. And now we know what those right fit clients are. We know how to attract them. We know what sort of content they're looking for. We know what sort of services they're looking for. Let's go find those. And as those come in, we also know that those other clients that are a problem can be phased out. So once you figure out, help someone decide, okay, here's something we're really good at and we can specialize in. Mm -hmm. um, And now you say, okay, here's, now it's time to go fishing or I don't know what the next step is, but you know, it's time to go start getting those people in. Can you give, uh, some I, some thoughts and tips on okay so content generation what does that look like how should that be done what are you know lead generation what are some of the again the ways to disseminate that content and get people in in the bet in, in your in your kind of philosophy yeah you bet um so content sounds good for many businesses and the idea of creating that content sounds horrible for many businesses true true Okay. Um, so we try really hard 
to implement systems that leverage their time in a different way. So we use a lot of uh, inside baseball terminology, so I apologize. I'll probably, I'll probably have to explain a few terms as we go. We do it for shorthand. Um, but one of the first things that we try to get uh, our clients to do is to start developing what we call cornerstone content. Okay. Uh, your guys' podcast, this is an example of cornerstone content. All right. You can do cornerstone content with research. You can do cornerstone content with uh, blog posts, video series. Um, you can do it with just you know anything that lets you create content that is regular. Right. It's consistently going out. It is meaty. So you can actually slice and dice it into smaller pieces. So again, your guys' podcast, you can write emails and social and show notes, and you got the podcast itself, and you got like you can pull out little sections of it for highlights. You can do all sorts of different things with it. So it's meaty enough to slice and dice. And it's not a one-trick pony, meaning it doesn't only live in one place. So just imagine if you built your entire business selling products off Amazon and Amazon goes, I'm not allowing it anymore. What happens to your business? Well, it's done. Right. Or what if you built your entire community on Facebook and Facebook decides, eh, we're closing down those groups. That would never happen. What are you, you going to do? <laughs> right? um, so with your guys' podcast, again, a great example, and I'm using it as an analogy because it's easy for everybody listening to understand. Now, let's say iTunes decides we're not doing podcasts anymore. Okay. Still have the yeah, audio. I still have other it. places that yeah. it's going out. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if it's if cornerstone content and that that's what we mean by that. So we try to push them to do that. And we combine that cornerstone content with their sales efforts. All right. So business owners, especially in the the, the businesses that we work with, um, and you guys are agency owners, you get this, your your best salesperson is you. Like that's that's the best person for doing biz dev in most situations. Um and so you need to be having conversations, you need to be building relationships, you need to be going out there and doing what you do really, really well. And so what we say is, okay, cool. Let's again, continue using your podcast as the example. What if you've identified that person that you really want to have the conversation with? And instead you say, come on to the podcast. We'd love to talk to you. We want to get to know about your business. We want to know the problems that you're facing. We want to know how you're facing those problems in order to improve. Well, now you've opened a door that if you said, hey, I want to have a sales call would probably be closed. And now it's open because you're actually providing some value to that person. We're going to give you exposure for this conversation. Two, you've taken the time you would already be spending to develop a relationship and you've turned it into something that you can transform into an asset for your business. And it's helpful to your audience. And if you attach a system to the back end of that, which I'm sure you guys have, right? That's all your time is invested in it. It's that one conversation. And then all the slicing and dicing, the production, the, everything along those lines is done by other folks who are really, really good at that. So it doesn't fall on your shoulders because we know if it's on the business owner's shoulders to get it done, it's not going to happen. That's yeah. That I mean, I, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, speaking from experience, I understand that cornerstone content and that leveraging that content really, really well. I don't think it's done very often, so I do think it's really, um, no. you know, it's a it's a light bulb that goes off when people understand how to do that. Let's say it's not a podcast though; like it could be right. a blog, right? Yep. Um, it could be a YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. and a lot, I think a lot of people think, oh man, well, I gotta, you know, do a YouTube channel or I gotta write a blog. I think, um, you know, it's really, correct me if, if you, if you disagree, but it's really what, what can I find that I'm passionate about that I can talk about, not for the purpose of writing a blog, but just for the purpose <laughs> of talking about it, um, Starting there, I think, helps it not be generic. It may not be SEO optimized and all these different things yet, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I think the most important thing is it's something that you can actually be passionate about, talk about, and add value about. And then you can kind of add those things later. Right. So probably the easiest way to figure out what you should be talking about, um, we do it through a process we call Content Blueprint, um, is essentially 
ask yourself, what is your core promise? What do you promise to achieve for your clients? First and foremost, start there. And then I would ask you, okay, if you could only choose three things, only choose three levers that you could pull again and again and again for your clients to be able to achieve that core promise, what would it be? Right? And and the reason why we choose three isn't because three is an arbitrary number, right? So three is the most complexity you can have in a system without adding extra unnecessary depth. So, right, if you have two dots and you draw a line between them, you've got two pieces of information and one, one level of depth. If you have three dots, you've got three pieces of information and three lines. So you've got three items and three levels of depth. Once you start going to four, pieces of information. Now, all of a sudden, you've got six levels of complexity. When you go to five, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So, three is is not picked arbitrarily. It's picked because it gives you the most bang for your buck as far as what you can communicate effectively. Um, And then under each one of those big levers that you pull, dissect it into tactical stuff, like tactical buckets. These are the tactics that make that lever able to be pulled again and again. And then once you've got that, you've got that piece right there. You've got kind of 12 different big headers underneath it. And what we find is it's super easy at that point to then just say, okay, how do you do that stuff? Can't be out, like, you've got to be able to assign it to one of these buckets, right? Um, what, what would you talk about in, that, on, in those buckets? And what we find is being able to get 50, 60, 70 topics, which by the way, for, you know, a podcast, a weekly podcast, you get over a year worth of content. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's good. Do you guys yeah. play at all in the traditional PR realm? We don't No. Um, which is kind of surprising. Uh, we get asked about that on a regular basis, uh, but that just is not our specialty is, is regular PR. What we found is um, if you do the thought leadership piece well, uh, the PR opportunities sometimes uh, present themselves because you're exactly who someone needs to talk to, right? And at the same time, if you're, it gives you the base in order to be able to go and follow traditional PR methods um, much, much more effectively. Because otherwise, when you go, hey, I want to, I want to get, you know, be be a writer in Forbes, and I want to be on the local news channel, and I want to get write ups in, you know, these different places, and the person comes back and says, well, what do you do? And you're like, well, everything for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually what it's ha- what, what, you're right. That's that is the curse of yeah, an agency. Owner. That's a that's a great article that sells. <laughs> that's that article. Right, sells. Exactly. Yeah, you can you can tell that. Well, well then you know, everyone that, reads it, and and you do everything. That's right, for them. and it's for everyone. <laughs> What, uh, <laughs> and you're going to do it all in 800 words. That's so right. It's yeah. amazing. What, what, is, what does your day look like? And what is your team? Like, what are the roles of your team? Um, oh, uh, okay. So, so my day looks uh, like, well, well, so we're a hundred percent remote agency. Um, so every morning we have a stand up uh, with our team, 15 minutes where everyone gives their, their most vital priorities. Um, and then we, uh, you know, we break during the day after that for everybody to go and do what they need to do. My day is mostly spent on coaching. Um, so my day consists of leading people through sprint process, uh, being there in you know strategy sessions on a quarterly basis to make sure that uh, everything is staying aligned with, with the original strategy that was laid out and to adjust accordingly. Um, and, and to really, uh, spend a lot of time teaching. Uh, so we do weekly free Q and A's, uh, where anybody can come in and we teach for 10 to 15 minutes on a topic that is really about growing your audience, uh, nurturing your leads or generating more sales, because those are our three big levers that we know, uh, agencies need to, to follow. Um, and then, you know, we also have uh, an, an online program. It's called uh, ASM or Authority Sales Machine, um, which is the same name as uh, as our book. And so we do uh, we do monthly teach and do sessions for those as well, where we take people for ninety minutes, and it's not just a like you know the typical talk at them like a webinar. It's cool. Here's the agenda. Uh, here's the here's the things that we're going to work out, and by the time we're done, you're going to have something actually completed for your business. 
Um, so that's where a lot of my time goes is strategy and curriculum. Um, and then for the team, we have specialties in all sorts of different areas. Uh, so we've got a team of about 16 folks. Um, and so I can, I can walk through, uh, kind of their, their day and their responsibilities, uh, but that could probably get a little bit no, long. Yeah. I just kind of curious, like just the general roles. Yeah. So. so the general roles, we've got multimedia producers for audio and video. We have writers, uh, we have, uh, account, uh, executives and account supervisors, content coordinators, um, you know, kind of the usual slew of, mm -hmm. of activities within, within a, in an agency. Yeah. So you actually produce the content for, I guess, yeah. for, as part of your program. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. imagine let's, okay. So let's just imagine again, using your podcast, what would happen is this particular podcast would be completed. It would go into a folder and then everything would be produced off of it that needs to be produced off of it and sent to you for review. So you'd get the edited audio, the emails, the show notes, the blog posts, the social media posts, the images, the everything along, you know, the, the quotable moments, you name it. And then once that stuff is approved, we do all of the posting for all of that as well. Yeah. That makes sense. Great. That's right. great. Can you yeah. talk real briefly? Um, I know through the years uh, of agency life, I've been um, at times very intentional about posting content. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I, that I've done that is I've seen the value of things that live online and that can build um, on top of each other over time. And I'm talking five, 10, 15, yeah. even 20 years. And what I, what I, the value for me and you know, the organizations that I've built or been involved in is that it's, it's almost a, um, a constant, a constant offensive strategy Um because yeah. in this day and age, you never know um, what could happen with a disgruntled client or um, there could be something that happens with an employee and all of a sudden you're scrambling to say, oh my gosh, the client, when they Google my company, they have all this kind of like negative stuff that comes up that may or may not be your fault. Um, thankfully, I've never really had to deal with that side. But I yeah. do know now that looking back, it would be really hard if someone Googles my name or companies I've been involved with. Um, it's pretty chock full of, of of positive and or at least content that ranks pretty high. Can you talk to that a little bit? The importance yeah, what, of that. Really what you're saying is, look, there's a vacuum. It exists inherently. Yep. Do you want to choose to fill it with content of your own making and direction? Or do you want others to fill that vacuum for you? Mm, exactly. Um, and yeah, being proactive about that is immensely helpful. And, and I think you, at the very beginning, you hit on something that's so critically important. And that is a body of work. And I think a lot of, a lot of companies um, undervalue what a body of work really means. So if you think about it, Every agency, every coach, uh, you know, every every person that's running any sort of a, a B2B service industry has folks within their organization that could leave tomorrow and put up a shingle and say, I do this because they're practi practitioners just the same way as the owner of the organization was years ago, right? <laughs> right. So... Because that, and everybody knows this, by the way, right? Um, because of that, there is a lack of trust for organizations that have just started because you don't have a track record. It's easy to say, I'm great at this, right? So real estate is an industry that struggles with that all the time. And it's a low trust industry because of that. Everyone comes in and says, I'm an expert. I'm a you know, great investor. Financial advisors have that same issue, right? Anybody can go and say, well, I now do it for folks. Well, what's your track record? What's your expertise? What's your knowledge base? How, how do you continue to educate yourself on this so you don't fall behind? Well, your body of work is what shows all of that. And it does build over time and it becomes more valuable over time, which is awesome. Yeah. And to your point, it creates a footprint. It fills the vacuum. It makes you more findable for, for the things that you want to be found for. There's tons and tons and tons of benefits 
but it does not happen overnight. This is not a silver bullet strategy. This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a building a business with intention strategy. Mm, that's good. That's really good. I think this is great. Yeah, Eric, uh, I think it's I, I think it's uh, needed for agencies. It's stuff that um, they know they need to do. Frankly, lots of businesses know they need to do, and it's just hard to do. Um, yeah, so thank you for walking through that. Yeah. So, Eric, how do how can uh, people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? You know, honestly, my favorite thing for folks to do um, is one, they can always obviously hop over to the website predictiveroi.com. Um, we have the weekly free Q and A's that's like right on the homepage. Uh, when you go to it, there's a button that says, you know, join our, our weekly Q and A's. Uh, it's a cool community and you ask questions and you get answers from all sorts of smart people. It is not just us pontificating from the top. It is, it is when you lay out a problem, you're going to be in the room with 15, 20 other people and they've all got experiences that you can draw from. How cool. Uh, so I definitely recommend that. And then if anybody is really interested in diving deep on this, we know it's hard. We know it's scary. Okay. Um, so we do have a book on this, which outlines it a little bit more clearly. So you can actually like sit down and think about it more than just what even a podcast lets you do. Um, and you can just go to predictiveroi.com forward slash free dash book and you're good to go. And it really is free. It's not one of those like <laughs> pay shipping and handling or whatever, right? We actually shipped a book to South Africa a few months ago and it ended up costing us several hundred dollars in order to make it happen. Uh, but we're we're serious about it. if you want that, we, we want to see businesses succeed. We know what it's like to run a business. It's hard, right? And any, any help that we can provide, awesome. Awesome. I'm going to go uh, order that book. Yeah, absolutely. Eric, yeah. thank you for your time this morning. And um, I know it's probably uh, hopefully been very helpful for the listeners. Is there anything else you want to say before we let you go? No, I just, uh, I think the only thing, well, I guess there is one thing. Don't let fear dictate the strategy of your company. Mm. Great word. That's good. Great word. All right. Well, Eric, thank you again for your time. PredictiveROI.com. Go check it out. And gentlemen, until next time. Yeah. Until next time. We'll see you later. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.